Welcome to the Work Wonders podcast, brought to you by Asta HR, where we simplify the human side of business. I'm Angela. And I'm Susan. Let's dive into today's episode and find out what you've been wondering about. In today's episode, you'll hear our interview with Selena Jeffrey. She's the CEO and founder of The Mentoring Movement, and she's established herself as a driving force in improving employee engagement, fostering cultural change, and empowering individuals to thrive in the workplace. So listen in while we talk to Selena about her research into high-performing teams and the impact of trust and emotional intelligence in creating better engagement and retention. So let's get started. This is the Work Wonders podcast. Hi, Selena. Hi. Great to have you here, Selena. I know. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to have our discussion today. Well, look, we love our interviews and our uh, listeners love it as well. It's a great chance for us to get to know a different perspective and learn something new. So we're really excited to talk to you today. Would you like to start by telling us a little bit more about what led you to what you're doing today? Uh, so I guess I started my career when I were in radio, in media, and um, I was a little sales executive and really smashing goals in that role. And I kind of always had this mindset where it was about like achieve and then move on and then achieve and move on. And that was when I started my career in regional New South Wales. And um, midway through my life in my very young age of Gen X slash millennial, (laughs) we're we're talking about this earlier, uh, is I moved to Sydney. And I really started to experience my career in a very different way. I was, not only was I achieving, but I was starting to sometimes experience, depending on the leadership style that I was managed by, uh, a lot of pushback. And from there, I went from media to finance and then started moving into the digital world and into digital insights and then also like tech and software. And one day I was actually reporting into a company into the UK and I landed for my first day in UK and I knew day one yeah. that I wasn't going to stay in that organisation. <laughs> I knew it was a very blame and shame kind of culture and it really wasn't going to, it didn't really align with anything that I was really wanting to achieve. And I knew within myself that in a culture like that, it's really difficult to be able to achieve highly. Yeah. And then COVID hit. Uh. <laughs> and so that really turned my world upside down mm. and what led me to now is I was like there has to be there has to be a solution to why certain leaderships and organizations that you go to you really succeed and you achieve highly and then there's others that you just really flounder mm. and from that I created the mentoring movement Uh, as I knew that mentoring was one piece of the puzzle on how to really build uh, an innovative and high-performing culture. So that led me to lead my own company and found that from the ground up. And then also at the same time during COVID, I studied an MBA because I really wanted to explore, well, what is the things that contribute to a high culture? And I also did a few other like courses during COVID, (laughs) my other... (laughs) Other people were doing things like watching TV and maybe <laughs> you having made... a beer or two, and I was like, okay, I just want to keep studying and finding out the answer to this. So mm. that is what led me here today. I'm really helping organisations and cultures really understand what are the fundamental factors to building that culture in a positive yeah. way. I love the way that your curiosity drove you from your own experiences to find out, well, what is going on here and what's what's important. I had a question about the mentoring Obviously, mentoring within organisations is is helpful if you've got the right leadership in place. But often the experience that I've noticed is that it's the leaders who are the ones who need the mentoring. You know, they is that also something that you assist organisations with? We so the mentoring movement movement as such is a software. So it actually manages the end to end relationship of the mentor and mentee mm-hmm. relationship. So it removes the administrative risk for organisations yeah. because we found a lot of organisations were running mentoring programs but they were literally managed on a piece of paper or on an Excel spreadsheet yeah. which took up oh. so much time. Um, so, yeah, so it depends on what the organisation is actually wanting to actually achieve. So is it more collaboration within the employees and leadership? Are they wanting to build more 
more authentic leaders or more emotionally intelligent mm-hmm. leaders or leaders that are transformational. And it just really depends on what the organisation – we are led by the organisation in sure. what they're wanting to achieve – me, myself, I actually work with leaders around how they can be better leaders, to be engaging their employees more, to be able to get them to a place where they actually have a high-performing team. That's the goal, isn't it? It always is. It is. And you um, mentioned the term earlier about a high-performance culture. Would you like to tell us a bit about the research that you've done into that? Yeah. So as you mentioned earlier around the curiosity piece, I really wanted to understand what it was that like how organisations are retaining that top talent and also how they're mitigating the quiet quitting phenomenon. Now, I do say phenomenon, but in saying that, if we're honest with all of ourselves, we've been quiet quitting for a long time. It's It's always happened. We've just given it a new name. It was just given a fancy name. (laughs) That's like, like, oh, I did that a long time ago. I I remember. (laughs) And I was looking at all the research on quiet quitting and, you know, Gallup's now calling it quiet quitting, but they've been researching disengagement since well, I've been working in mm. this field and the stats have always been come out pretty much the same. But mm. tell us what you found. Yeah, you're right. Like that's a good point. I, I just think, oh, we're talking about this quite quitting, but I'm like, I've, that's been something <laughs> around for a long time. Like, exactly. Just disengagement. We used to call it disengagement, yeah. yeah. So going back to the, the research was I went in there to understand, okay, millennials firstly are a very misunderstood generation Angela. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I am one. I sometimes I am, depending on who's talking <laughs> about the age group. They are quite misunderstood. And I wanted to understand, okay, well, how are top organizations really retaining that top talent? And again, mitigating that quite quitting. And then I focused on a single case organization that mm-hmm. was a global leading consulting firm. And then I also narrowed down the research on the millennial generation. I did a broader right. kind of approach as well in the research, but I really wanted to understand the millennial generation. It was so interesting. I started with looking at, okay, what is it, what is the research telling me? What is it that millennials are wanting in the workplace? Mm-hmm. And so I used secondary data and did a lot of research. I took my whole soul um, understanding, <laughs> okay, what are the key themes around what millennials are wanting? And what engaged them were things such as they want to align themselves with organisations that are doing good in the world. So not just saying that they're doing good in the yeah. world, but actually acting on what they're doing mm-hmm. and having showing. A yeah, having a purpose. Mm-hmm very different to older generations, for example, where it was more like you had to go to work and it was about just getting an income to support the family and to be able to have a job and be getting that money to be able to buy the home and the car. Where millennials are very, they're driven by different factors of if you don't engage me and you don't build certain things within the workplace and make me feel feel certain ways, I'm not going to stay. I will leave. I will just become unproductive and I will quite quit. Mm. So throughout all of the research, what I found so interesting was that time and time again, what keep what kept coming up was trust. Mm. I trust my leader when they do this. I trust mm-hmm. my leader when they do this for me or that for me or we have conversations. Jacob Morgan has run a lot of research around the employee experience and he's also the author of books such as The Future Leader. Mm-hmm. And he says that the high-performing organisations that have high performers but can also retain them longer than the average tenure of around 18 months mm-hmm. is the organisations that will ask the question. So the question is such as, what is it that you need from us? What do you feel you're experiencing? What is it that we're not doing right? What do you feel that we could do better? Mm-hmm. Then not only have they asked, but then they also acknowledge. So it's, okay, I acknowledge, I hear you, I hear what you want, I understand that. And then the third factor is about acting. Yeah. And what the unfortunate piece is from that research was the fact that not a lot of organisations even do the first step, which is asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then some organisations organisations will ask, and but they won't acknowledge. Yeah, that's right. And then or acknowledge their part in how that person's feeling or how they're feeling about their work. Yeah. Because, I mean, it is a tough conversation sometimes. Sometimes mm. you may want to, you want to ask, but you don't probably want to know, know the answer. answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, how about I just bury my head? That's right. Over here in the I know things here. aren't quite right, but um, yeah, do I really want to go there? Yeah, exactly. And it's like, well, if you ask and you don't acknowledge, it's like saying, 
how are you? Oh, sorry, i got to go. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> I don't really care. Yeah, yeah I don't right. really care. I've got other things to do. And, and it's such a fundamental thing to do and it's really only three steps but it's so so challenging for a lot of organisations and leaders to actually do it because the third step is, okay, I hear you, I acknowledge what you're saying yes. and then the third one is act on it. Yeah. So, for example, if we talk about maybe the topic that's happening right now where – um, employees are being asked to come back into the workplace. Mm-hmm. There's been some organisations that have kind of um, had a lot of press uh, coverage at the moment because it's said that they're being they're forcing people mm. to come back into the into the office, and it's it's around that piece of okay, well, what does the data say? Mm. Are you asking your people <laughs> when are you more productive? Because Research is saying that people aren't productive when they come in. They're too busy catching up mm. and having coffees and, and ha- missing that social time. Well, so much depends on the individual as well, doesn't it? And that's another part of the whole engagement piece. You know, we can't assume that one size fits all. Mm. Very true. And that it isn't. Like it's, okay, well, how do we design this workplace so we get yeah. the best outcomes and at the same time be able to have engaged employees? Those three questions is a really it sounds simple, not. It's not simple, we know that. But it sounds like something that you could grab hold of. Just simply asking someone, what do you need? And taking it step by step is a really interesting thing. So did you find that from your studies, the workplace that you that you did your study on, your research on, were they doing those three things? Yeah, absolutely. So they have, for example, just alone in the Australian market, 12,000 employees. Mm-hmm. And they not only did they ask, they acknowledged and they acted. Over 12,000 mm-hmm. people. Yeah, and that was the difference and that was the fundamental factor of what built the trust in the organisation. That was when I really started to really understand, like, it was trust. And if you think about it, trust is such a fundamental emotion for all of us because if you don't trust somebody, you're not going to open up and talk about things that are important to you or how you feel. Yeah, and you're also not going to talk about when things are going wrong, (laughs) you know. Yes, exactly. Which any manager needs to know as soon as possible. Because guess what you'll do? (laughs) You'll quite quit. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be like, I don't trust this organisation. I feel or. Or you'll just come in and just do what you have to do. Mm. Or you'll do the you'll do even worse and you'll actually contribute to a toxic culture. Mm. And that's the that's a such unfortunate thing. If you're enjoying today's content and you know of someone else who might benefit from it as well, why not tell them about our podcast? Simply mention the name Work Wonders Podcast and let them know. Do you know how many hours that we spend in our lifetime at work? Like oh, just working. way too much. <laughs> we spend over 80,000 hours at work. That much time that we're spending and 87% of us are unhappy. And I keep saying mm. this over and over again is that unhappy workers cannot be the very soul of our organisations and society. Mm. And disengagement and attrition is such a global societal problem. I agree. It's, it's so, it has such effects on the wider community, the families of those people. Yeah, and how engaged they are in other things in their lives as well. Because if you're disengaged and unhappy at work, you're probably not going to have a lot of energy left over. What a perfect point, Susan, because the unfortunate piece, again, that organisations fail to understand is that when you're you're disengaged in the workplace, you are unable to be able to compartmentalise that you you carry it into your workplace. And Gallup has actually run a study around the percentage of people that are happy at work and it follows through into your personal life. And if you're unhappy at work, it actually, again, follows through to your personal life. So from so, one to the other and back again. Yes, mm. absolutely. You cannot separate it. Mm. So if you're unhappy at work, you won't have the energy to show up at home. You kind of don't smile at the, the barista when you're ordering a coffee. Yeah. And again, it's a global societal problem because we need society to be engaged and happy. Mm. And happy is sometimes can be... Uh, maybe s- described as a fluffy word, but at the end of the day, if you're not happy, it really affects and has such a flow on flow on effect to the bigger the bigger picture in life. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted sure. to add that you reminded me of a leadership workshop I did years ago now, where there was um, a, you know a group of people, but there was one guy in particular in that group who were the middle managers, who was known throughout the organisation organization for how helpful he was, how nice he was. Everyone, you know, if you want something done, you ask him to do it. He's such a helpful person. 
And we had a discussion about the impact of that if that's not what you're necessarily motivated to do. If you're not being yourself and you've Mm. got a lot of work yourself and you're doing work for everybody else as well. And then we had a two-week break. Two weeks later he came in and he said, well, I've quit. And it was because he'd realised the impact that was having on his family because not only was he working long hours Mm. but once he got home the mask was off. It was like, you know, Mm. he, he was exhausted, he'd had enough and they were feeling the brunt of it. And oh, his yeah. wife had said to him, you know, this can't go on. And so he quit the job. Again, that's a perfect um, point on the fact that he obviously, there wasn't trust there for him to actually show up at work as his, as mm. his real self. Mm. So he was putting on a face at work to be this person, but it's not sustainable. No, it's not. It's not. And that's what you want. You want your workers to be able to come in, be able to show up and, and as their whole selves. And I don't mean like a whole selves of, as in come in in your – Pajamas. Pajamas. <laughs> I mean, sometimes their pajamas are comfortable. <laughs> um, but, like, to be able to really be able to, to speak up in meetings and share ideas and know that if you do share an idea, it's not going to be shut down. It's going to be yeah. considered. And, again, all of those factors come back to that trust piece. So mm. things that are important to you. So if you're an employee – and women's rights is really important to you being able to speak up for that if that's particularly prominent in, in yeah. whatever the organisation's doing. Or is that the sort of thing you're talking about there, the values coming to the front? Yeah, absolutely. And the thing at the end of the day is that we're all individual and as we're talking about designing a workplace so that everybody can feel um, included. themselves and included yeah. in an organisation is because the thing is that everybody has something that you can learn from. Mm. We all have something to learn and we all have something to teach. And sometimes we view talking about different generations is that different generations or younger generations don't necessarily have something to teach us. But that, if you miss that, you can learn something from all generations Mm. because they bring a different perspective to the organisation. What I went further into the research and I thought, okay, I was like, okay, I understand trust. Mm. I get it. Understand that trust builds high performance and also kills performance. But then there's so many different traits and different leadership styles. I was like, how do different leaders build the same thing that is trust? Mm -hmm. How? How do they do that? And what I found, which was fundamental, when I dug into all the data, I could not believe that the fundamental piece that builds trust in organisations is emotional intelligence. Oh, okay. Okay. What happens is leaders will be like, emotional intelligence, emotions in the workplace. No, <laughs> that, doesn't no exist. that doesn't exist. It's like, no, we're too busy over here. We've got, to, we've got to achieve these KPIs. We've got to do these sales. We've got to have these meetings. We've got to do all this stuff. Yep. But the crazy stuff is, and even Brené Brown, this has come out of her research, and you know how much I mm. love Brené Brown, mm. is she said that if you shut down the very thing that makes us human, you're shutting down everything, which is emotions. Love that. And emotions yeah. make us human. Mm. And at the end of the day, every single one of us have emotions and we're all human. Yeah. And it's the only thing that separates us from artificial intelli- artificial intelligence. Yeah. You think about it, at the moment, artificial intelligence cannot have emotions. So true. With all the empathy, self-awareness, mm. all of those factors, that leads up to emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Yeah, it just makes me think as you're talking there, there's, yeah, definitely people I've spoken to, leaders in business and business owners that, yeah, do grasp with that feeling of like, oh, aren't we just here to do a job? Aren't we just here to achieve this, to do that? But really, there's a lot more to it when you dig down. So it's really yeah, and actually, there's, absolutely. Um, you know, there's actually responsibilities on leaders now to provide you know psychological safety. There's um, under workplace health and safety. There, there's a whole lot of requirements for psychosocial safety in the workplace. That's yeah, true. absolutely. So as we talked about the ask, acknowledge, and act. Mm. If you don't have emotional intelligence you may not necessarily have the ability or the awareness to be able to, one, identify that there is something wrong in an organisation mm-hmm. or an individual, so you don't ask, or you ask but you're unable to self-regulate mm. so you can't acknowledge because mm. other things get in the way. Oh, my it goodness, on. it's me. You feel it's defensive. It's my leadership. You get defensive. It's the ego plays. And then even to be able to take on information and feedback that may ne- not necessarily align with something that you agree with, mm. then you won't act on it. So 
going back to your study that you did on that particular organisation and there was a focus on them being engaged, I'm wondering, did you do any or did you have any data there around the performance and how that was improved because of it being more engaged? Yes, absolutely. So we went into the data around, okay, they actually build trust. And the data actually reinforces and supports that high trust built high performing mm. teams. Without high trust, the teams actually fall apart. And that is the fundamental difference. You have to build trust. Because if you think about it, if you don't trust somebody, which I mentioned before, is that you're not necessarily going to work harder for them because you don't necessarily feel valued. You don't trust that what you actually are doing is valued, that they're going to acknowledge it, that they're actually going to do the right thing with it, all those kind of factors. Mm -hmm. So when you have high trust and you have high trust in your leadership and the organisation as a whole, you'll perform better. You're more productive, you're more innovative, you're, you're more creative, you're willing to speak up in meetings and that is the very factor that either will build a team or break a team. And that the ability to be able to build high trust teams lies in the fact that you can be that you are emotionally intelligent. Mm. You're able to be self-aware, you're able to self-regulate. But what I found so, so comforting out of all of the research that I did, which really is something that we should really take on board is the fact that emotional intelligence can be learnt and taught. Well, that's good news. That is so good (laughs) because if you imagine if everybody is willing to actually go, okay, am I emotionally intelligent? Could I do better? Or organisations roll out emotional intelligence training and they monitor it and they track it and Mm -hmm. they see improvement. While you were talking about trust, one thing that was running through my head was that trust does take time to develop as well. So ideally, you want leadership who have that emotional intelligence, who are able to make people feel that they're trustworthy right from day one. I think it was Brene Brown in one of her books that said trust is grown in those really small moments. There's no big gesture Trust in a relationship is grown over the, hi, how are you? How was your weekend? Do you need me to do that? You know, would you like a coffee? That, like the little things, you can't sort of pinpoint it down to one particular event where you go, oh, that's the day that I started trusting them. Yeah, it's built over a long time. And that's... <laughs> we had a golf day. Wow, we're all <laughs> trusting each other now. One thing that we need to remember is that with leadership and emotional intelligence, you can't build high trust if you're not being... Like, I know this is a very word that is used a lot, but authentic. If you don't truly care, it's like the same as with mentoring. If you don't really care for that person, how can you possibly be able to mentor them and do what is best for their best interests? And as leaders, it really is our social responsibility to be able to lead teams in an authentic way. And it is our responsibility to be able to work on ourselves, to be able to be self-aware, self-regulate and really work on that emotional intelligence piece Mm -hmm. because when you can actually do the factors that underpin emotional intelligence, then you can actually be authentic and build that trust. People know when you're not being real. They do. People aren't stupid. Mm. And if they don't say it, they're thinking it. Mm. Mm. And, And that's the fundamental piece is that if you're not authentic, you can't sustain building trust because you don't really care. You're just wanting to get the job done and get outcomes out of your people. But what the unfortunate piece is, is if it's not authentic, trust can be broken overnight. It's so hard to build trust, but with work and consistency, it can be built. And that means you have teams that are fully engaged, they trust you, and they will perform highly for you. Mm -hmm. And I know some managers and some of our listeners will probably go, oh, like, <laughs> I've got 15, pe- to do. 15 people reporting to me and you mean I've got to see them all as individuals? <laughs> Treat yes. them like, you know, that person A's needs are going to be different from person B's. How am I going to Absolutely. consider that and how am I going to balance all that out across my team? Welcome to well, leadership. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that's why you get paid the big bucks. That, though, is that if you look at the numbers, $7.8 trillion each year is spent on attrition. Yeah, That's look at global. what it costs okay. you to replace somebody. Oh, yeah. Gosh, it's a lot cheaper to keep someone in a job than have to find someone new. Exactly. Like that. At the end of the day, the data shows that engagement is fundamental to a business's success regardless of size or industry. Yeah. So as leaders, 
we need to be able to ask those questions. So even from a global perspective, to be able to send out surveys yeah, and really look at the trends and themes in those surveys. And even in a smaller organisation of 100 people, 100 people is send out those surveys mm. or sit down with your people on an individual basis and really just have those conversations. Yeah. Because if you look at that employee across the table from you, if you build trust with them because you really value them and you want to keep them because they're fundamental to the success of your business, then you don't know if you don't build that trust and have that conversation that they're not quite quitting. Absolutely. You don't know. It's a measure of how engaged they are as you're doing that, isn't it? Mm. So you get that assurance back from them that they're happy in their job, they're likely to stay and all of that as well, which is going to go a long way for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, it's not just the asking, it's the acknowledging and the acting as well. Thanks so much, Selena. That was great. Oh, no, no. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. I always love talking about um, employee engagement. So So do we. Very passionate. (laughs) Don't we? (laughs) We do. Well, as usual, we'll pop your links. Uh, If people want to know more about the mentoring movement uh, and can get in touch with you, we'll pop that in the show notes so you can access that from our website, astahr.com.au. As usual, let us know what stood out for you from today's episode. What's something that you'll be taking away back to your business? Let us know on our LinkedIn page, Work Wonders Podcast. With the public holiday coming up, we'll be taking a short break next week, but we look forward to talking to you after that. Speak to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Work Wonders podcast brought to you by Asta HR. Hit the subscribe button now to never miss an episode. And if you'd like to continue the conversation with us, you can find us over at astahr.com.au. See you in the next episode.